Good evening, everybody. Good to see everyone out. I thought I had some announcements, but I don't think I do. <laughs> so, so it is good to see everybody uh, tonight. Um, I would say the only announcement I had is no patch, but that's it. You've already figured that out by now. So I think that was the only one from this morning that was important. No patch, and I think all the parents have figured that out at this point. Uh, I can tell. So we're ready to go. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody. Uh, again, uh, it's good to have the Stone Houses here with us today. They were a blessing this morning. Uh, hopefully everybody was here to be able to be a part of that. And it's good to see everybody back out this evening. Be in prayer for Pastor as he flies in tomorrow, uh, that everything will be all good. The weather will be nice and no problems. I feel like any day, it used to be you just get on a plane and you flew without any problems. I feel like today you get on a plane and when you make it without any problems, that's a miracle, right? It's like you have to have, nowadays there's some story every time you get on a plane. So anyway, just pray that all that goes smoothly and they make it back here. Uh, and what a blessing it was for them to be able to get out there. I hope everybody had a wonderful week. Uh, and it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Let's, uh, let's open in a word of prayer and then we'll uh, start off in a song. Brother Tyler, would you mind opening us this evening in a word of prayer? Amen. Well, grab your hymnals. Go ahead and stand. Turn to page 617. 617, we're going to sing, I'll Fly Away, page 617 in your hymnal. Turn to page 297. 297, we're singing, Are You Washed in the Blood? Page 297 in your hymnal. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood? Grace this out. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you in the blood of the Lamb, do you rest each moment in the cruciation? 
saved, but are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bride? Find me washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood? Aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Sing it out. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? All right, Brother Craig, would you pray for our offering this this evening, please? Amen. Thank you, baby seated. Well, let's sing one more song before Brother Stonehouse comes. So stand, grab your hymnal, turn to page 136. 136 in your hymnal, we're singing, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, page 136. Savior leads me, oh the full 
greatness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed the mortal wings its flights to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Thank you. You may be seated. Brother Stonehouse, I'm going to turn it over to you. So I get out of here. All right, thank you, though. <laughs> okay, here we turn to Genesis chapter 3 once again, if you would. It's always a pleasure to come here, by the way, and, and um, enjoyed myself, enjoyed your company, and, and uh, I'm so glad to. The church has such a heritage, and uh, it's just a blessing. Um, I think all the years it's been here and, and been a lighthouse here in this community and in the whole area, really. And uh, oh, I'm sure you're glad to be a part of it, and you ought to be glad to be a part of it. So, <clears throat> well, we're blessed, aren't we? Aren't we blessed to be saved? Amen. And, and, uh, Blessed to be saved and blessed to be in a Bible believing, Bible preaching church and and uh, the fellowship with fellow believers. Um, that's all so necessary and, and we thank God for it. <clears throat> all right, chapter three. Chapter three. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll go ahead and, um, boy, I got a long, kind of a long message here. Um, let me, uh, let me start in verse eight. <clears throat> we know that the first, um, the first six verses have to do with the temptation, um, by Satan and, uh, the woman's confusion, maybe not confusion, but just maybe, uh, some carelessness possibly, um, concerning the word of God and then, uh, Satan's denial of what God had told them as a warning for eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was death. And, uh, and of course, we see her succumbing to uh, the temptation. Um, uh, another one, she must have believed Satan's lie that you shall not surely die. And then with the offer of being her own God, and uh, she can make up her own rules, so to speak, and do her own thing do what she wanted to do, independent of God. That was enough for her, I guess. She ate of the tree. Um, by the way, we all have that problem. Um, that just desire not to... We don't like rules, do we? You know, and, and not, that, not that we live by a bunch of rules, not that, but, um, but many see God that way, just a, a taskmaster. And uh, really it's a... A false view of God. He's not a taskmaster. Well, I hope we understand too that all the commands of God really are for our good. All of them are, and to obey God is going to result in good things. And um, uh, you say, "Well, wow, what if I'm persecuted for obeying God?" Well, that's a good thing. When you get to heaven, you'll be glad you did. Amen. And, uh, um, but God's commands are for our good and His glory, and we need to be convinced of that, uh, because things don't always look good to us, and things don't always feel good, but God works all those things together for good, and the Bible tells us that very plainly in Romans chapter 8, and He's conforming us to the image of Christ, and in the things that <clears throat> uh, He does in our life, whether, whether it feels good or whether it doesn't feel so good. Um, God's working all those things together for our good and, of course, His glory. So uh, we need to rejoice in that. And <clears throat> we slip up now and then. We get our eyes off of that, don't we? We, get, we can get frustrated. And, and um, I'm having a time with my truck at home. I've got a 73 Ford pickup, and uh, um, I've got a carburetor that just will not do right. Uh, that car, I, it needs prayer. I mean, if you want to pray for my carburetor, it would be a blessing. 
<laughs> but what a trial that thing has been. I'll tell you, it just will not run right. And so I bought a new one. I mean, it don't run right either, so I don't know, maybe something else. That's frustrating uh, to me, personally. And uh, anyway, uh, but God is uh, teaching me some things, and I th one thing is, is patience. <laughs> he's teaching me patience. He's been doing that for a long time. In fact, ever since I've been saved, he's taught me and been trying to teach me patience. <laughs> Cause I, I'm, a, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a get her done type of guy. I hate to be held up on anything. I, you know, let's get it done and get out of here type of thing, you know. And um, uh, no, it just bugs me to be, to be held up on anything. Something not right, even though I know it should be. It's not working right, even though I should be. And uh, I get frustrated at times. But God is still working on me. I think I, I shared that with you this morning. God's still working on me. Still learning things from the Bible. And um, I've been saved 47 or 8 years now. And still learning, still learning things. And uh, thank God for that. Um, I believe in eternity we'll always be learning of the the majesty and the wonder of God, and uh, that, there's no end to it. You can cannot really exhaust really the the uh, attributes, the the wonders, the perfections of God, and uh, we'll be amazed forever. <clears throat> All right. So anyway, we looked at we looked at the first six verses and chased a couple rabbits there, and uh, so we're going to look at verse seven and to the end of the chapter, and I want to pray before that we get started there. So let's pray together, okay? Our Father, we thank you now for the wonderful privilege that we have of serving thee, of being saved first of all, but then uh, you have said that we're laborers together with thee. And Lord, what an honor and privilege that is. And our Father, we do pray that you would help us to, to really uh, take that seriously, and we, we do pray that we might enjoy our labors for Thee, and that we might glory in what You do through our labors, and um, just the fact that we have the privilege of serving with Thee, and that You would actually uh, trust us with something uh, that is important to do. <clears throat> we thank You, Lord, for that. Thank you for working in and through our lives. We thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us. We're grateful, Lord, that even the difficulties of life, in fact, probably especially in the difficulties of life, you grow us and, and you help us to become more Christ-like in our life. Uh, we thank you, Lord, then, even for the trials of life. And uh, we, we do pray that you continue to work in our hearts and help us to continue to submit, Lord, our lives to you. Uh, we want to say once again we're blessed and we're thankful and we especially have uh, uh, celebrated that here as we think about the Thanksgiving Day. But we pray that every day would be a day of thanksgiving for all the good things you do. Now, Lord, we pray that you'd bless in this message. Lord, do help us to come to an understanding of some things that need to be understood. We pray that you would reinforce that which we do know that you have said in the Bible and uh, Lord, we just pray for a growing strength in Christ's likeness in our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to start in verse 7. Of course, course in verse 6, uh, the woman takes of the tree and gives to her husband and he did eat. And <clears throat> by the way, her husband was not deceived. He apparently knew full well what he was doing. Um, the Bible does say that Eve was deceived. Uh, <clears throat> And maybe that's why it says that as by one man sin entered in the world, uh, he purposely ate knowing what was going to happen. All right, verse 7, And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And by the way, the Lord knew where he was. He wanted Adam to figure out where he was, right? 
Um, and then he said, I heard thy voice, Adam speaking here in verse 10, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. By the way, there is some difference of opinion on that last part of that, that desire shall be to thy husband. Um, and um, I think on the surface, we, we might, um, and, and maybe rightfully so, uh, translate that as that rather than her desire being for God, it would be more toward her husband. Um, I think on the surface at least it says that much. Uh, some, some have said that, that, uh, that she would desire to be in the place of her husband. Now, it doesn't say that, but they feel like because of the language that that uh, there would be a constant the man trying to rule over the woman, the woman rebelling against the husband. Um, there certainly is maybe some validity to that. And I think that the sin nature, again, we talked about this morning, rebels against anyone uh, who is in authority over us. So it could be. But um, I think very, very uh, plain, it's the plain understanding of the English here. Uh, that she would desire her husband more than God, and that the husband now would rule over her. Um, and by the way, there's, there's two ditches. There's a ditch on either side of that. Some husbands will not, will not lead, and that's not good. But then there are some husbands that are, that are overbearing, and that's not good either, right? So there's ditches on each side of that. There's a way to lead and a way not to lead. In verse 17, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it Wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, uh, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Okay, so we'll not get to all of that tonight, but um, I do have some things uh, here for you. In fact, uh, I've got a whole mess of notes here, and uh, some of it um, I'll be I'll look like a paper hanger here in a minute, uh, swapping swapping pieces of paper and notes around here. So we looked at we looked again at the serpent and its usage in the Bible. Um, talks about the physical snake, a reptile, and also of Satan himself. It's also used metaphorically of, of liquor uh, in in Proverbs uh, twenty three. Um, we find that uh, Satan, also known as a devil, by the way, Satan, I'm sure you know, means adversary or enemy, and devil means slanderer or false accuser, and he does that. Uh, we dealt with his subtlety, his audacity, his lies, and viciousness in all that he does. The temptation of Eve, or folly, and listening to the devil, and disregarding God's command not to eat of the tree of knowledge, 
And then very briefly, we talked about the promise of a redeemer and deliverer, and we thank God for that. And uh, you see the mercy of God. And the very same day that they sinned against God, God sought them out and said, there's a deliverer down the road. Now, it would happen 4,000 years later, uh, but, God, <clears throat> but God did send that deliverer, we know, as prophesied of in verse 15 of our text here. Uh, and then we looked at the picture, a uh, picture of God providing salvation, and a, a picture of the substitution of the innocent dying in the place of the guilty and the shedding of blood for man's sin in the fact that God clothed them with skins after they had tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And again, it was a complete covering uh, compared to a partial covering of the fig leaves. And so we've looked at all of that. So I want to look at, at the immediate consequences here uh, that we see uh, in our text here. Number one, uh, we see their eyes were opened, it says, and they saw that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made aprons for themselves and an attempt to somehow hide their shame and their guilt. And uh, they recognized the guilt and shame of what has been done. And the eyes, of, uh, the eyes opened to the fact, and I'm quoting here, their eyes were open to the fact that the serpent had deceived them. They had disobeyed God. They had incurred the displeasure of their creator, sustainer, and lover of their souls. And they had brought ruin and destruction to themselves and their posterity. My goodness. Oh, my. You think about the guilt that a person would experience. I think they did not really realize yet uh, all that that would mean, but... Nevertheless, they understood that. Their eyes were opened uh, to the fact of what sin brings to a, a person. And so they sought to cover uh, themselves with uh, fig leaves, an apron of fig leaves. Um, fig leaf aprons represent man's efforts to hide his guilt and shame. But it doesn't do the job, does it? And we, we know that in the very physical sense, an apron of fig leaves would, would leave, still leave them half naked. And so it really illustrates man's uh, best efforts to fall short. And by the way, those that think that their good deeds or religion or baptism or faithfulness to church will save them, I mean, that's fig leaf religion, okay? Uh, it, does, it doesn't work that way. There's nothing wrong with those things, but they do not save. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And that alone, he alone can uh, save and does save those who call upon uh, him. Now, here's something, too, that uh, kind of uh, run across my mind as I was uh, studying this, this text here. is a thing of self-consciousness. They, 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 they tried to hide their shame. They, uh, all of a sudden, they, they, they knew they were naked. All of a sudden, that was an issue. And uh, we see the thing of self-consciousness and self-centeredness. You know, it's interesting, I was looking in the Webster's Great Big Dictionary, you know, the unabridged version, and, uh, and the, under the word self, uh, there were a thousand entries. Now, not all, of the, uh, not all of those were defined, but it'll have several, and then down at the bottom of two pages, basically, uh, there was all the words that start with self, and it's amazing. there was a thousand, a thousand of them. Now, I didn't count every one, but I counted the column and then multiplied by how many columns. It came out to about a thousand times that the word self uh, precedes um, uh, another word. And uh, not all of those are bad, and not all of them have to do with man. For instance, uh, a self-loading gun or rifle or pistol is it just uh, is a semi-auto, so that has nothing to do with man. Uh, not all are negative. I'm being a self-starter. That's a good thing. You know, someone who will take the initiative and start, that's a good thing. But so many have to do with negative things, like self-will, self-serving, self-love, self-righteousness self-pity. Uh, there really is, because of sin, a preoccupation with a self. And it's so much a part of our sin nature uh, to protect our reputation, to protect self, to, to uh, protect our self-image, or the image that we, we want others to see in us. That is so much a part of our sin nature, this thing of self, 
self. We're, to, we're, we're all told, aren't we, to die to self? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? To die to the cravings of the old nature, to die to it? Now, by the way, um, some will say, well, I've got to die. But, you know, self has to die. Well, self won't die until you die, okay? But we can die to it. That is, we don't have to respond to the sin nature once that we're saved. And that, that's really correct. That's, that's biblical, to die to self. That thing of self-centeredness, self-pity, self-whatever, uh, in a bad sense, were to die to those things. So it's kind of interesting there uh, about the thing of self-consciousness and how many words in the English language start with self. We are preoccupied with self. And then uh, we see they hid themselves from God or tried to. Isn't that an amazing thing, trying to hide from God? I mean, it's interesting, Adam, who named all the animals, I mean, he had to have a mind that was something else to be able to do that, not only to give names to all the different insects, and all the reptiles and amphibians and all the animals, both wild and tame animals, um, and, uh, and then remember them. Man, what a mind he must have had. <laughs> uh, and yet he thought he could somehow hide himself from God. <laughs> wow, <clears throat> that just shows you what sin will do. Um, we know that Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the good and the evil, right? He knows, he sees everything at once. Uh, he, he occupies both heaven and earth at the same time. God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. And so it's ridiculous to think that we could hide from God, but he tried. And then number in verse 10, we see the thing he was afraid and apparently afraid of retribution, uh, fearing, facing God who is infinitely just and powerful uh, to whom we are all accountable, fearing the one whose love, benefits, and care has been rejected in the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then, oh boy, blame shifting. Now we could really have some fun with this one, couldn't we? Um, uh, Lord, it's the wife you gave me. You know, it's the woman you gave me. I, I don't know if any of you guys have ever, you know, thought that way. Certainly not. Uh, right, guys? Uh, amen. I can't even get an amen out. Are you afraid to say amen on that one? But no, we've all, we've all, uh, you know, I, well, man, uh, the Lord, you gave her to me. So actually he was blaming Eve and then indirectly blaming God at the same time, wasn't he? Uh, let, let's, um, let's read it here again. Let me see. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Like, you know, it's her fault. And, and Lord, you're kind of complicit in this because she's the one you gave me. So we see the thing of blame shifting. That's so much a part of the sin nature, isn't it? Blame shifting. Blame shifting. Well, let me see. I wrote some other notes down here on this, so bear with me. Uh, blame shifting. Adam blamed Eve and, and indirectly God, and then Eve blamed the serpent. Now, the serpent was probably looking around to see who he could blame, but all the other animals had scattered by that time, and, and uh, so they couldn't be blamed. So, it's much like man to shift the blame to someone or something else. It's so much like us to protect that self-image and self-righteousness by putting the blame for our failures and our sins on someone else. By the way, you ever notice how many victims there are today? When, and when I say victims, there are, there are real victims, obviously. But, you know, uh, modern psychology, they're already telling that someone's a victim. You know, they commit a crime, well, it's your upbringing, it's where you were raised, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I'm sure that that does have some effect. But everybody, it seems like, is a victim. Let me say this. Those with a victim mentality will always have an excuse for failure. I want to read that again. Those with a victim mentality will always have an excuse for failure. They're not going to go very far in life. Now, let me time out just for a minute. What about, what about real victims? Because there are real victims, and we don't want to minimize that or deny that. 
Uh, there are awful things that people go through. There are awful things that, that happen to people. We had a guy in our church years ago who, uh, he could not hold a job. I, I mean, I've never seen anyone that could get a job as fast as he could. I mean, he'd get fired, or he'd quit, and it seemed like the next day he'd be working somewhere else. And probably in the year or so that he came to church, he must have had 10 different jobs. But, but his excuse was always, I heard this so many times, since my abuse, since my abuse. And he apparently had been abused as a, as a young child, but he bounced all over, and his excuse was, was his abuse. Um, and I'm not minimizing the effects of true abuse, but why continue to live there? Why continue to live there? Why experience the pain over and over in our memory? Why continue to experience the abuse in your, in your mind? I mean, if someone knifed us, what sense does it make that for forever, uh, the rest of our life, we continue to knife ourselves, at least in our memory and in our mind? That doesn't make sense. Um, forgive. We must take responsibility also to obey the command of God to forgive our enemies, to, uh, to forgive those that have offended us, to forgive those that may have caused some tragedy in our life. Because if we do not, unforgiveness leads to bitterness, and we don't want to become bitter. That's sin, and it's miserable to be bitter, bitter. All right, well, time in once again, and uh, I think that's an important thing to say. So we find blame shifting. Now, are there any questions as we, as we look at these things? I mean, what we see here, uh, we find here that uh, the serpent or the physical serpent, the snake, um, was cursed above all cattle. So there, there's, a, there's a, um, a result of that. And then we find in verse 15, we find the spiritual serpent, Satan, is addressed. And, uh, and then we find the woman is addressed in verse 16, and then Adam is addressed in verse 17 and following. So are there any questions about the enormity of sin? Um, we see here in our text, righteousness lost. Adam and Eve are created without sin. They were created without sin. Um, and before this event in Genesis chapter 3, we, there's a world that's without sin. Of course, they were the only ones in the world, at least humans in the world at that point. But there was no sin in the world until the fall of Adam and Eve. I don't know how long that lasted, but there was no sin until the fall. Man has not been touched by sin. It was a perfect environment. Remember, God said it was very good, uh, that it was good, and he rested on the seventh day. Uh, Eve was a perfect wife, Adam was a perfect husband, and they met with God. There was no sin, and so there was a perfect relationship. And so sin, we understand, meant, meant righteousness lost. And then also paradise lost. Um, we find paradise lost. Um, a living, the living now would be made by the sweat of uh, Adam's brow. And of course, it's been that way uh, ever since, hasn't it? And he would, he would struggle with a reluctant earth. He would struggle with thorns and thistles. And ever since the flood, of course, bad weather, drought and famine and flooding and ruin and insect invasions and war with all its destruction, it was paradise lost. And then his posterity was affected. Romans 5.12, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have uh, sin. So Adam and Eve died that day, not physically. Adam lived to be 930 years old, and that's an amazing thing. I wouldn't want to live that long with my sin nature. I don't know about you, but he lived 930 years in that very almost yet perfect earth and, and uh, with perfect food just about. And uh, so he lived a long time as those in the pre-flood civilization. And, and we find that uh, not physically, but spiritually, he died just as God said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So he didn't die soulishly, he didn't die physically, but he died spiritually in his relationship with God. Um, 
And so there they brought forth after their own kind when they had children, just like everything else God had made, whether it be plants or fruit trees or animals. A sinner can only bring forth another sinner. And uh, so we find the sin nature was passed on to their children. The fallen nature is passed on. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's none righteous. No, not one. Not one. Uh, You don't have to teach a child. I think we see this. I've talked to people who say all these little kids are so perfect. And I'm sitting there inside. I'm laughing because uh, you don't have to teach a child to lie, do you? You You don't have to teach them to do that. You don't have to teach them to fight over toys or uh, be possessive. Uh, We don't have to teach them uh, to throw a tantrum when they don't get their way. They just do that kind of thing. Why? Because they have a sin nature. That's just natural uh, to them. Um, We don't have to teach them to be selfish. It is all inherited. It is inside. Years ago, I preached a message um, comparing... Um, sin to leprosy. Now, I'm not going to go back to Leviticus 13, where it speaks about, well, there's several chapters there in uh, middle uh, Leviticus that deal with leprosy. But some deal with leprosy in the house, some in clothing, but leprosy in the individual in chapter 13 of, of Leviticus. And um, there's a, uh, it's really a type, if you would. I spoke about types this morning, and and uh, it, it too is a type. Leprosy is a type of sin. Um, understand that leprosy was a dreaded disease. I mean, it's kind of like cancer today. Uh, there, there's actually more that can be done for cancer today than could have been done for leprosy back in that day. I mean, if you had leprosy, it was like a death sentence. Uh, and a whole lot of suffering in between, maybe years and years of suffering in between. But uh, if a person had a spot on their face or somewhere in their body that would not heal, uh, they would go to the priest. In fact, they were commanded to go to the priest, and and he would examine that spot, and uh, if he determined that it was leprosy, boy, that was a change in the life. Uh, they would be banished from society. I mean, if it was a husband or wife, they would actually be uh, told to go out and out somewhere in the wilderness, and they were not to associate with their family. They were not to associate with anyone else, anyone that did not have leprosy. They they were they were ostracized. They were quarantined, if you would. They could not be around. And if you approach someone with leprosy, they would have they were uh, they were to hold their hand over their mouth and, and say, "Unclean, unclean." In other words, don't get near me because I have leprosy, the dread disease. So they would live in leper colonies. The families would come and bring forth food and set it down and then back way off and then the leper would come forward to get that food because they had no means of income. And so they had to be fed by others in the community. And um, their, the, their fingers and their toes and their ears and their nose and their lips would, would, would be eaten away by that dreaded disease. And so it became hideous looking. Um, it was a very humiliating disease. Someone that had, w- was absolutely beautiful or good looking would not very long after that look hideous without a nose, without ears, without lips, without... And they would wrap their hands, they would wrap their face uh, to hide the hideousness of the, the look that leprosy had caused in their life. It was something dreaded. And knowing, too, that they would never, probably never, except an act of God, they would never be able to live with their family and friends and in society again ever in their life, and it would shorten their life. And so what a, you know, I got to thinking one time about the, the likeness that there is to sin in leprosy, and so I want to give you some things concerning that. Um, Sin, like leprosy, is more than skin deep. And by the way, uh, Leviticus 13 makes that statement uh, very clearly. 
uh, leprosy apparently is caused by a virus or something inside. It, 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 it manifests itself eventually on the outside, but it's not like a skin rash or uh, something like, like poison ivy or something like that. Um, it's not like that at all. It starts on the inside and begins to work its way out. So it's more than skin deep, and it affects every part and just like sin uh, in the very nature uh, comes out in this life, all that are born of man and woman uh, have that nature inside. Every one of us, Psalm 51, verse 5, In sin did my mother conceive me, and I was born in iniquity. And uh, David there in Psalm 51 recognized the fact that, that the sin nature is deeply embedded in us, and we get that at conception. We're born with it. And there's nothing that you and I, by the way, can do about that. We can't do anything about that part of it. Now, we can be forgiven by faith in Christ, but uh, we can't do anything about the sin nature until you and I die. Um, we find that the sin, like leprosy, continues to erupt. Now, we in human energy cannot control it. Uh, in Genesis 3 and verse 5, uh, you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. We looked at that this morning. And I believe the primary meaning here uh, is as gods knowing good and evil. That is, you can decide as a god what is good for you and what is evil uh, for you. And we looked at the thing of autonomy, of independence from God, that thing of wanting to cast off what we might think of cords of God or those commands or those rules, and we don't want to live under them, even though we know that they're cords of love and bands of mercy and compassion, and they're good for us. But that's the way that the sin nature looks at rules and authority. But um, there was another truth that I made mention of, I think, twice in this morning's message, uh, we would know good without the power to do it, and we would know evil without the power to avoid it. And that's so very true. That's so very true. Without God, we'd be, I'll tell you what, if it was not for salvation, if it were not for the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, will be lifted in the tribulation. Boy, it's going to be an awful time, by the way. Uh, but if it was not for, for God, we'd all be a bunch of reprobates without feeling, not sensing God or His Word or what's right. Uh, we'd be a, more of a mess than we already are without God. So sin like leprosy is more than skin deep. It's embedded deep down inside of us. I've got a theory on that. I don't know if it's true or not, but you know something, uh, uh, there's, there's nothing that really, let me see how to put this, there's nothing that uh, occupies more probably of our, our being that is actual tissue than the blood. And I understand we're 70% water, something like that, but, but blood has tissue. Blood is tissue. We red corpuscles and white corpuscles and all of that. And there's, there's no tissue that so permeates our body as the blood. I wonder if sin nature might be in the blood. But if it is, it is certainly deeply embedded. It affects every part of us because the blood is in every part of us. Again, that's the ravings of a Baptist preacher, <laughs> but that's a, just a little theory on my part. But. And then sin continues, uh, sin like leprosy continues to erupt. We can't control it. We can die to it with the help of God, but only a saved person can do that. Um, but it continues to erupt. And, and by the way, the most, the most holy person on the face of the earth is still not sinless. Maybe visibly, but still, motivation, thoughts, and so on that no one can see, we still do sin. Um, thirdly, sin like leprosy makes a person utterly unclean. It makes a person utterly unclean. Romans chapter 1, actually Romans 1 and 2 speak of what sin 
uh, about the sin of different groups. And uh, Romans chapter 1, we see men, a, a people without restraints. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's an amazing bunch. And uh, God has, they're, they're so wicked that God has turned them over to a reprobate mind, it says in Romans chapter 1. And it has to do with the, the, the heathen, those that have completely rejected the Lord, and they just, they're just they just living an ungodly and wicked life. And then Romans chapter 2 starts off with a self-righteous Gentile. This is one that has, has maybe religion or uh, maybe some uh, rules or self-discipline or um, uh, some kind of self-restraint or... Uh, let me see, what's the word I'm looking at? I, uh, I'll move on, but, but uh, even he, the Bible says, the self-righteous Gentile, he does what he condemns in others. <laughs> so he sins. Romans 2.17 deals with the Jew, God's chosen race, who had every advantage. They had the Bible, they had the prophets, and so on. And yet we see that by their lives, they had caused the Gentiles to blaspheme God. The very thing they said that the Gentiles ought not do, they were doing. And then we get into the section that says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and so on and so forth. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, the awful effects of sin. Awful effects of sin. Um, we find under that, that sin caused the entire human race to fall. Boy, isn't that something? Cause the entire human race to fall. Adam and Eve's sin caused all of us to fall and be born with the sin nature and, and so on. It's also the cause, sin is the cause of millions who will spend eternity in hell. The Bible says that, that uh, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure in Isaiah chapter 5. <clears throat> uh, and that's so true. Uh, millions and millions have entered into that place called hell, and there are millions more who will enter into that place, and eventually the lake of fire. And then it caused the Son of God to come to this earth as a man and be treated horribly and go to the cross and die for those sins. I'll tell you, sin's no laughing matter, and we should never minimize sin. Sin's an awful thing. It's no laughing matter. And then uh, next is sin like leprosy is vile and humiliating. It's vile and humiliating. And again, as we think about the leper and that which goes on in the body and how humiliating that would be that you would wrap claws around to hide the, the fingers that have been eaten away and around the face or the, uh, those features to be eaten away and so on. It is a humiliating thing. It's a vile thing. And I imagine, I imagine it didn't smell all that good either. Vile and humiliating. Sin is like that. You know, you think about sin, uh, man's inhumanity to man. We think about vile and humiliating. Look what men do to each other. You think about that. You think about the genocide. Uh, it's hard to believe that it hasn't been that many years we find the extermination or the attempted extermination of the Jewish race in the 1940s, in the early 1940s to mid-1940s, that, that, that what we would call a civilized nation would commit such genocide. The inhumanity of man to man. And Africa, very same thing. I mean, when the tribal wars and so on, um, I'm sure you read the news concerning this attack by Hamas in, into Israel and putting babies in an oven and turning on the oven. Have you heard, have you heard about that, what they did? Decapitating little kids, uh, shooting whole families, uh, sometimes in their bed and, and so on and so forth. I mean, they were probably the fortunate ones, those that died by a bullet. They burnt some alive, burnt many alive. If they wouldn't come out of their safe room, they just set the whole house on fire, and they burnt. They were burned alive. My goodness, man's inhumanity to man, man's inhumanity to man. And then they try to justify it. And we got so many in our nation now are trying to justify that. What a joke that is. Man's inhumanity to man. Um, the wars, the genocide. 
uh, torturing individuals before that they were killed. Um, how about things done in secret? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 and 12 talks about those things done in secret. We're not even going to get into that. The sins done in secret behind closed doors. It's, it's awful. By, by the way, this thing of trafficking women and trafficking little kids or sexual trafficking, when they catch those guys, they ought to just shoot them on the spot. My goodness, that's wicked. It's wicked. Uh, it just, it just, sometimes I just want to go hunt them down and do that myself. I know that's not right. Uh, excuse me. I'm not perfect yet. That's for sure. But uh, I take the law into my own hands. That's not the, the way it's supposed to be. But that just makes me sick. And it's, it just, it just makes me angry to think about a daughter, a granddaughter. I've got a daughter. I've got granddaughters, about, about seven of them. And someone Someone kidnapped them and put them in a brothel somewhere and having to serve, you know, 40, 50 men a day. I'll tell you what, if I could get a hold of someone like that that did that, I, I might lose my salvation if that were possible. <laughs> Man's inhumanity to man. And not that people in rest homes deserve it, they sure don't, but... They find themselves in a rest home, dying, no longer capable of what they used to be, maybe even just a few years ago. It's not a, it's not a result of their personal sin necessarily, but it is a result of Adam and Eve's sin. It is a result of having a sin nature. That's the end of it. Uh, Adam would go back to dust, it says here. But I've, I've ministered in, in uh, rest homes before, and and uh, you just see those with, with their bodily functions. They have no control over them. See someone in a wheelchair, and there's a bag of urine underneath the wheelchair. Some are out of their mind. They're just yelling out and speaking out of their mind. They're talking to people that are long since dead. And Man, we're talking about sin like leprosy is vile and humiliating. Individuals at one time, good parents, they were bosses, they were very sharp, they had a great mind, a great body, maybe athletes who have great talent athletically, but now they look at them now. Vile and humiliating as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. Next, sin like leprosy requires separation. Sin like leprosy requires separation. The leper had to go and live in a leper colony. They couldn't live at home anymore. And without God's provision, without the forgiveness that God has provided for us and salvation, separation from God is, is, is all that is left and it's forever and ever and ever. And then sin like leprosy is incurable by man. We can recognize it, but we cannot cure it. We can recognize it, but we cannot cure it. We recognize it, but cannot cure it. Only God, only Christ is made to be our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, only, only Christ who is made to be our sin. And when we accept Christ as Savior, we are born again and have the promise of eternal life. Only He can cure it. He is the only one that can cure it. The blood of Christ is the only thing that will wash away our sin. There's nothing else that will do that. And what an example of the effects of sin we have in the very next chapter when Cain, out of envy and anger and hatred, kills his brother Abel. I mean, the very next generation. Isn't that amazing? You would think that this thing would go more in steps, you know, kind of downward steps, but no, the very next generation, Cain kills Abel. And we see the effects there of sin. The very next generation. Is there any question about the enormity of sin? The awfulness of sin. Okay, I'm going to um, try to get done here. Um, and then the next point is all sin has consequences. We know that God addresses the physical serpent, and God addresses the spiritual serpent, or Satan. He addresses Eve and Adam. 
And it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what good we may have done in the past or what good we may be doing now. Sin has consequences. And that's so clear in the fall of Adam and Eve. By the way, Eve and Adam and Eve didn't have to eat a bushel of fruit, did they? They didn't have to do some dastardly thing to fall. They just simply disobeyed God and ate a piece of fruit. Uh, I don't know how much they ate, doesn't say, uh, but I think as soon as they took that bite, they probably knew something was wrong. Amen? Um, obviously, without Christ, the consequences of sin is a lake of fire. But in the Christian life, there are also consequences. Now, we are judicially, when we get saved, saved forever. We are judicially forgiven of all our sins, past, present, and future. And we will not face those sins when we face God because Christ has paid the price for them and we are seen in Christ. We are, we are completely and forever saved. The Colossians chapter 2.10 says we are complete in Him. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. If it wasn't for that, we'd lose our salvation. But um, in the Christian life, there are some things, and let me read a verse here first. Uh, there are some things that can die because of sin. The wages of sin is still death in a, in a sense here. Not in the same way with an unbeliever. Um, see, I need to go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. All right. <clears throat> verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's just a general statement concerning sin. Now, for the unbeliever, it will eventually mean the lake of fire. But for the believer, sin still does have consequences. God does not tempt us to sin. He's not the tempter. Uh, he's not the author of sin. But we are tempted, the Bible says, and we're drawn away of our own lust. And we still have lust in our life, uh, even as a believer. Things that we desire sometimes more than God. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, we'll not lose salvation. It does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that. We are secure in Christ. Um, but it can be the death in the sense of destroying some part of our life or relationship here and now. For instance, adultery will usually bring about the death of a marriage. Um, and by the way, pornography can do the same thing. I understand from Christian counselors that, that women usually view pornography just about the same as they do adultery. But so can an angry, an angry, uh, uncontrolled anger can certainly cause the death of a marriage. Drunkenness can cause the death of a marriage. Dope usage can cause the death of a marriage. Neglect can cause the, the death of a marriage. Uh, mental or physically uh, uh, being cruel or mental and physical cruelty can cause the death of a marriage. Those things are sin and they can cause the death of a marriage. And that's a shame. The death of a family. Um, it can cause the death of a Christian testimony. There's a kind of a humorous verse I want to go back to. It, it really is, is not meant to be humorous, but uh, just the way it, it, is, it reads here. In Ecclesiastes, in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, way back there uh, in the Old Testament, in, uh, let me see, Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 1, and it says this, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. In other words, dead, anything dead put in your perfume, ladies, will cause it to stink, right? That's what, that's what it's saying there. And then it goes on to say, So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. We see the same effect. Our life, our life can become a stinking savor 
by foolishness, and especially the foolishness of involving ourselves in sin in some way. The death of a Christian testimony. We find the same thing in Romans. I mentioned it just very, very briefly. Uh, as far as the Jew is concerned, um, Romans chapter 2 and uh, in verse 17 talks about, it addresses the Jew uh, here and talks about, you know, they're an instructor and a teacher and they have, you know, they consider self, themselves a guide of the blind and a light of them which are in the darkness and, and so on. Um, it says, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking of the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles through you. That's what he says there concerning the Jew. It can be the death of a Christian testimony. It doesn't take much for us to lose our testimony, especially with an unsaved world around us. It can be the death, at least temporarily, of a closeness with God. On the national level, it could mean the death of a nation. And I think that we're seeing that right now in our nation. You know, it's a lot different today than it was when I was a kid or a young person. Things are different today than they were then. Um, and hopefully we experience revival and God will turn this mess around. But if it keeps going like it is, it'll be the death of the United States of America. The death of a church. Sin will destroy a church. Backbiting and gossip and, and uh, um, well, just a whole lot of things, right, that can destroy a church. False doctrine selfishness of some kind or another. The death of our usefulness to God. God's not going to use us like He could if sin is in our life. Now, we understand, once again, we're not going to lose salvation over that. We certainly can be restored to fellowship by confessing our sins, but the consequences may affect our lives for years and maybe even for the rest of our lives. I have a I have a very had a very good friend who got as a pastor and the president of a Bible college. Some of you may know the story. Who got involved with a girl and and um, he has not been used like he was at one time. He it may affect our lives for years or the rest of our lives. He's too old now, probably, to go back and try to do it over. Um, he's got to be 80 or better. He'll never be a pastor again. He lost all that the rest of his life. Sin's an awful thing. Sin has consequences. Now, I know this is probably not a very comforting <laughs> Thanksgiving type of message. But that's kind of how the Lord led. So, um, I'm so glad, though, that God is merciful. God is gracious. God is long-suffering, is He not? Um, God certainly attempts to straighten us out and, and we're out of the will of God. I can't help but think back in Amos chapter 4 where God said, I sent this famine in, in your, into Israel, and yet you would not repent. And then the next verse, I, I sent war. Your, many of your sons were killed in battle, and, but you would not repent. You would not return unto me, saith the Lord, is how it goes. And, and he said, I sent this, and I did that, and I, one chastisement after another, but he said, you would not return unto me, saith the Lord. And then he finishes up and says, Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Oh, oh. God's gracious. He is gracious. He is holy and he is just, but he is also, thank God, loving and good, and he's gracious. 
He's merciful. He's long-suffering and compassionate. Thank God for that. And, and really, um, uh, that's in the Bible. This is biblical. But you know something? We ought to want to serve God because we love Him and because we want to say thank you by our actions, our attitude and words for the one who has saved us and been so good to us. That should be our motivation, not just fear. And I realize a lot of this stuff has been, you know, fear. I'm not trying to fear monger, but, but nevertheless, these things are biblical and they're true. Um, but our motivation really ought to be because we love God. We want, we want to live the best life with his help that we can. We want to do right and glorify God. Um, in our life because of the goodness that he has expressed and showed to you and I. And he has been so good to us. So good to us. We thank him for it. Well, that's the message. Um, I hope I haven't um, put a downer on you. Uh, but it is the truth. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'd bless now the message and our Father, we want to thank you, first of all, for your goodness, and we thank you for your long-suffering and compassion, your love for us, your desire that we be like your Son. We know that you are working in our lives to, to uh, conform us to the image of your Son. We, we know that by your Word, Lord, and, and we thank you for that. And Lord, we do pray on the other side of that, that... that we not get off on our own, and we do not reject the Word of God. We, we, uh, we pray that we not backslide or, uh, or become complacent or, or we just become apathetic or unconcerned. Our Father, we pray that, again, we would be in the Bible and be encouraged by it and strengthened by it, taught by the Bible, that we would surrender ourselves daily to the Spirit of God and your leading in our life, uh, that, Lord, we would abhor sin and love righteousness. And we know that was said of the Lord Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you would teach us, uh, again, warn us. Uh, we pray that all the operations of the Word of God would be active in our life this evening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's take a few moments to consider the things said. Let's stand, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have prayer and we'll dismiss. God bless you. I appreciate your attention and, and uh, it's a privilege for me to preach to you. I thank you so much for being here. Father, we pray now that you'd uh, dismiss us with your grace. and Lord, we pray that our mind and hearts be stayed upon thee. And Lord, we do pray for protection as we travel home. 
And Lord, again, help the truths that we've looked at to live on. And we pray, Lord, that it would affect our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.